This is a one-part session on lung ultrasound. This session is actually a combination of keywords from two collections, respiratory and anatomy. It made more sense to me to combine them into a single presentation, so I have taken the liberty of doing that. I'll start with ultrasound anatomy of the normal lung. This includes not only normal findings, but also the appropriate techniques for lung ultrasound. Although lung ultrasound may be performed with a linear, curvilinear, or phased array probe, the linear probe is best when examining more shallow structures, for example, the pleura looking for sliding, and the curvilinear is best when looking for deeper structures, for example, when looking for V lines. This ultrasound demonstrates a normal pleural line. It appears as a horizontal hyperechoic structure below the ribs and represents the interface between the visceral and parietal pleura. The image produced by the ribs with their acoustic shadowing and the hyperechoic pleural line has been termed the bat sign. Purportedly, the pleural line is supposed to represent the body of the bat, and the two ribs represent its wings. No matter how hard I look, I don't see a bat in that, but if you do, more power to you. Your imagination is obviously better than mine. Disclaimer, I am not an artist. This illustration attempts to show the transducer, skin, gel, ribs, and pleura all of which are labeled. A-lines are a classic example of reverberation artifact. In this sequence, the transmitted beam, blue, strikes the pleura, green, and is reflected to the transducer, red dotted line, which generates the image of the actual pleura as a hyperechoic line. The original ultrasound beam also bounces, or reverberates, between the skin and the pleura, as shown by the red arrow. Some portion of the reverberated beam is also reflected to the transducer, as shown by the pink arrow. Remember that the ultrasound machine determines the depth of an object, orange arrow, based on how long it takes the reflected signal to be returned to the probe. Because the reverberated signal takes approximately twice as long as the reflected signal from the original beam, as indicated by the longer orange arrow, a reverberation artifact, light green, appears at a depth approximately twice the distance between the skin and the actual pleura. This ultrasound demonstrates an A-line. As previously described, it is a reverberation artifact of the pleura which appears as a horizontal line at a depth that is a multiple of the distance between the skin and the actual pleura. There are several characteristics of A-lines. First, they are identical in shape to the pleural line. Second, they occur at regular intervals deep to the pleural line. And finally, the brightness is diminished with each replication. Lung sliding represents the motion of the visceral pleura over the parietal pleura. By definition, lung sliding is a dynamic process. As shown in this video, it appears as shimmering or sliding between the two layers. Normal lung sliding may be represented by a still image obtained in M mode results of which are termed the seashore sign. Ostensibly, the parallel lines at the top of the image, indicated by the blue arrow, represent waves, and the granular texture below the plural line, indicated by the red arrow, represent the sandy shore. These are the images that will be addressed in this section. While not exactly pathologic, a mirror image artifact merits at least a brief comment. Watch this video. 
Notice that although the plural line moves, there is no shimmering or sliding evident. This indicates the absence of lung sliding. Notice the difference between the motion of the plural lines on the two videos. The video on the left clearly shows back and forth movement on the plural line, which is absent from the video on the right. Lung sliding is present on the left, but absent on the right. This is an M-mode image that occurs in the absence of lung sliding. Termed the barcode or stratosphere sign, the area below the plural line shows parallel lines essentially indistinguishable from the area above the plural line. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the seashore sign and the barcode sign. Notice that the differences are confined to the area below the plural line. Obviously, the first prerequisite to see lung sliding is that the lung underlying the probe must be receiving ventilation. An esophageal intubation, apnea, or intubation of the contralateral mainstem bronchus will all result in the absence of lung sliding. Also, the interposition of anything between the visceral and parietal pleura will result in the absence of lung sliding. Examples obviously include air or blood. Finally, although perhaps not common in the general population, a pleurodesis or a prior thoracic surgical procedure which resulted in scarring between the two layers of the pleura will also result in the absence of lung sliding. This video demonstrates what's termed a lung point. Notice that no lung sliding is present to the left of the red arrow and that lung sliding is sometimes present to the right of the red arrow. Here's another video that demonstrates a lung point. No lung sliding is evident to the right of the red arrow and is sometimes present to the left of the arrow. A lung point identifies the point at which the visceral and parietal pleura become separated in an pneumothorax. When imaged in M mode, a lung point presents as a seashore sign alternating with a barcode or stratosphere sign. As already noted, the absence of lung sliding can be caused by a variety of conditions. The presence of a lung point is essentially pathognomonic for a pneumothorax. Watch this video for four or five seconds and answer the question of whether lung sliding is present or absent. While there is clearly motion of the plural line, it is synchronous with the heart rate, not the respiratory rate. This is termed a lung pulse. This M mode image of a lung pulse clearly demonstrates that the image alternates between a seashore sign, blue arrow, and a barcode sign, red arrow. The presence of a lung pulse indicates that the underlying lung is not being ventilated. Another potentially pathologic finding on lung ultrasound are B lines. B lines are the result of widened intralobular lung septa and permit propagation of ultrasound waves. This image shows multiple B lines. By definition, B lines are hyperechoic, discrete, begin at the pleural line, move with lung sliding, extend to the periphery, and obliterate A lines. Notice how these characteristics are present on the adjacent image. While not a great image, this video shows bee lines moving with lung sliding. Since a normal lung fissure may result in a bee line, to be considered pathologic, there must be three or more bee lines in a single interspace. The presence of bee lines under the probe is consistent with anything that causes widening of intralobular septae. Limitation of bee lines to one area of the lung 
for example, the right lower lobe, is consistent with a localized process, pneumonia. The presence of bee lines throughout both lung fields suggests more generalized pathology, for example, pulmonary edema. Next, we'll talk about the spine sign. Here's an abdominal ultrasound showing the diaphragm, liver, and kidney, all of which are labeled. This image actually shows two pathologic features. Although not relevant to the discussion of lung ultrasound, the blue arrow indicates Morrison's pouch, the potential space between the liver and the kidney. The liver and kidney should be immediately contiguous. The fact that there is a hypoechoic area between these two structures is consistent with some form of free fluid in the abdomen. What's more interesting from the perspective of lung ultrasound is what's termed the spine sign. Normally, presence of air in the lungs results in the inability to visualize the spine above the diaphragm. This image clearly shows the spine both above and below the diaphragm. The ability to see the spine above the diaphragm is indicative of the fact that something which transmits ultrasound, most likely fluid, is located above the diaphragm. Now it's time to discuss mirror image artifacts. Here's another abdominal ultrasound. Although it won't be the basis of this discussion, note that unlike the prior abdominal ultrasound, there is no hypoechoic stripe in Morrison's pouch, the area between the liver and kidney, as indicated by the blue arrow. Notice the area indicated by the white arrow above the diaphragm. What does that resemble? The liver? That's exactly right. No, the patient doesn't have liver above the diaphragm. This is an example of mirror imaging artifact. This is perhaps a better example of a mirror image artifact. Ideally, what happens is that the ultrasound beam, exemplified by number one, strikes the diaphragm and is returned to the probe where it is interpreted as a hyperechoic line. In practice, however, some of the beam is reflected from the diaphragm as represented by the second arrow. In this case, it strikes a cyst, labeled C, is reflected back to the diaphragm, as represented by arrow 3, and from there back to the probe, arrow number 4. Because the probe calculates distance based on the amount of time it takes the ultrasound waves to be returned, it shows another cyst above the diaphragm. Note that this mirror image artifact is shown at the same distance above the diaphragm, represented by arrow number 6, as the actual cyst is below the diaphragm, represented by arrow number 2.